the Friends of the Health Public Library, and the Health Life Saving Museum. I wanted to give a special thanks to Health Community Access for coming out tonight and taping these events. Um, I also wanted to mention next month's lecture. We'll be focusing on, on the outdoors uh, next month, so on May 9th. We will, we will be hosting Brian Cassie, who's one of the authors of the National Audubon Society Field Guide to the Mid-Atlantic. And our focus is going to be on the seashells of Nantasket Beach. So if you have, um, if you picked up some exciting or interesting seashells along the way and were ever curious to find out what they are, now's your chance to be here to identify them for you. Um, we have one more exciting uh, upcoming program that is being put on by the Health Public Library, but I will leave it to Helen Weiser, Friends of the Health Public Library, to introduce the event and also this evening's speaker. Most important thing, I am going to introduce William Martin. He is an award-winning New York Times bestseller <coughs> author of 10 novels, a PBS documentary, book reviews, magazine articles, and a cult classic horror movie also. <laughs> His first, first Peter Fallon novel, Bat Bay, established him as a master storyteller. He has been following the lives of great and anonymous in American <coughs> history ever since and has taken readers from the Pilgrims to 9-11. He was the 205 recipient of the prestigious New England Book Award given to an author whose work stands as a significant contribution to the culture of the region. He lives near Boston with his wife and has three grown children, and one of them just had a baby. Yeah. And so he is a grandfather. Thank you. And here is William Martin. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Great venue. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving a shout out to my granddaughter. Her name is Charlotte. She almost made it on uh, her birthday, her, her grandmother's birthday, my wife's birthday, but she made it the next day. But that's all right because it's Washington's birthday, so it'll always be a holiday. Um, and she also, getting the name Charlotte, uh, became the namesake of her great-grandmother, who's still around to see, her, uh, to see her birth. That's pretty cool, too. My mother's 95 now. Um, I'll, I'll tell her. I'll tell her she got an ovation. And uh, I would show you pictures of Charlotte, but that would take all night. <laughs> but I will take a picture of you, if you don't mind. Once in a while, when I have, I love having, that, that's right, Helen, take the glasses off. You want to look good. <laughs> there we go. Um, and that's my subtle way of saying, anybody? put your phones on vibrate, who happens to have it in your pocket. Um, my name is Bill Martin. I write novels. I write historical novels. The best description of what I do came one net afternoon in the, uh, the middle of the summer, probably 25 years ago, when one of my sons was sitting out in the backyard with his friends talking about what their parents did. One little girl said, well, my mummy is a doctor, and she goes to the hospital every day and makes people better. And another boy said, well, my daddy's a lawyer, and he goes to court every way and every day and puts away bad guys. And my son said, my daddy's a writer, and he goes up in the attic every day and makes stuff up. <laughs> and I do. However, because I am known as a historical novelist, I don't have to make that much up. When you're a historical novelist, for example, you always have plots. You always have structure. We can talk about the uh, three days at Gettysburg, something that small and discreet, or something as enormous as the movement of white Europeans from these very shores to the far shores of the Pacific, and we can always talk about these things in terms of three-act structures, beginnings, middles, and ends, uh, the things that make stories work and make sense. Get the character up in the tree, throw rocks at him, get him down out of the tree. We always have structure. We always have characters, uh, characters we love, characters we hate, and characters we love to hate throughout history. Uh, when you read the Lincoln letter, I hope you come away loving Lincoln and hating Booth 
And by the time it's over, you will learn to love to hate General George Brinton McClellan, I suspect. Uh, I can never say that I have writer's block. Uh, when you are writing historical fiction, there's always that great research to do. And I resolved uh, when I was writing my second novel that I was only ever going to write novels from that time forward in which the research was fun. This decision was made when I was writing a book called Nerve Endings about organ transplantation and I was in an operating room about to observe my first surgery. And I thought, never again do I want to write a book about this. So with the next book, which was called The Rising of the Moon, about Boston and Ireland in the weeks before the Easter Rebellion, I got to sail on a three-masted schooner and drink in the pubs of Ireland. And when I wrote Cape Cod, I could grab a fishing rod any afternoon and jump in the car and as my wife would say as I was pulling out of the driveway, where are you going? I'd say, I'm off to do some research. Um, when I wrote Annapolis, the novel about the history of the Navy, I got to take $600 million worth of uh, your tax money in my bare hands, drive a nuclear sub 250 feet below the surface of the ocean. I looked over my shoulder at one point, and the sub was going 25 knots under the water. I said, that is really fast. The executive officer who was right behind me said, don't tell the Russians. Um, I also got to fly off of uh, an aircraft carrier when I wrote that one. Uh, the last thing that the executive officer said to me as I climbed aboard the C-2 Greyhound was, don't have your tongue between your teeth. Because if you have your tongue between your teeth when the catapult hits, and the catapult can throw a pickup truck over the horizon, well, it's just the wrong place to have your tongue. And uh, that's the opening line of Annapolis. So with all of my novels, there's always been that wonderful research. In the Lincoln letter, of course, I've had a great time traveling the battlefields and wandering the streets of Washington, D.C. But I'll get to that in a minute. The other reason I like to write historical fiction is that I get to blow things up. Now, in order for you to understand what I mean when I say I get to blow things up, I have to take you back to my beginnings in Hollywood. Uh, I wrote a couple of screenplays when I went out to California. Actually, I graduated from college. I said to my father, Dad, I want to go to film school. And he said, film school? I'd really rather see you go to law school. But if you don't do what you want to do when you're young, you'll spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. Good advice. So I went to the USC film school and figured out that the quickest way into the business was to write screenplays. So I wrote screenplays that nobody wanted to produce. Uh, and then one day a producer said to me, you know the way you write. And when they frame it like that, grab your hat because you're on the way out the door. The way you write, you ought to write a novel. And so I wrote Back Bay. But before Back Bay got published and became a bestseller, and meant that I didn't have to have a real job after that. Uh, before Back Bay got published, a friend of mine in Hollywood called me up. We had moved back here to Boston, and she said, we have an assignment for you. Now, she worked for the man who had given Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, Peter Bogdanovich, James Cameron, that whole generation of filmmakers their start. Roger Corman, the king of the B pictures. Here was my opportunity to work with Roger Corman. So who was I to turn down a movie called Humanoids from the Deep? <laughs> Stars Vic Morrow, Doug McClure, Ann Turkell, and a bunch of guys in rubber suits that come up out of the Pacific Ocean and terrorize a Northern California fishing town that looks suspiciously like Mendocino. Um, Sometime toward the end of the writing of this movie, I was back in Hollywood working on it, Roger Corman called me into his office and he said, you know, he's a very aristocratic seeming man, belying the quality of the movies that he makes, you know, the foreign distributors really don't like the way this movie ends. You think you could come up with something better. And so there I was, the young Tyro screenwriter perched on the edge of the sofa. I said, how about this? How about if the monsters are attacking the dock at the end of the movie? They're tearing the dock out. People are falling into the water. It's a terrible scene. But Doug McClure, our hero, 
is out in the harbor in his fishing boat, and he has a 50-gallon drum of gasoline on the boat. He takes the gasoline, and he dumps it into the water, and then he pulls out his flare gun, and he fires a flare into the water, and the whole harbor explodes, and we kill all of the monsters except for one that we save for the sequel. Roger Corman looked at me, and he said, yes, explosions. I like explosions. The audience likes explosions. You remember this for the rest of your career. When in doubt, blow something up. <laughs> Ironically enough, at the beginning of my next novel, which was called Nerve Endings, I blow something up. It's a fishing boat. And riding on the fishing boat is a movie producer <laughs> named Roger. I saw him some years later and reminded him of that story, and he said, well, what I was really trying to get across to you was something that the great Southern California detective novelist Raymond Chandler always said was his best advice to young writers. When you run out of ideas, bring in a man with a gun. In essence, introduce conflict into the scene, and history always provides us with men with guns. Men with guns women with strong ideas, even, for example, as in the case of the novel Harvard Yard, a flea carrying the bubonic plague bacillus that infects London and kills all of John Harvard's family, so he decides to come to America. All of these things provide me with material, so I always have something to work on, and uh, that's why I like to write historical novels. Why do you like to read it, though? People always say to me, well, why should I read one of your books when I could read a good history about this? And I always say, well, when you think about the Wars of the Roses, if you ever think about the Wars of the Roses, do you think of Hollinshed's Chronicles or do you think, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse? And when you think of the French Revolution, do you think of uh, the cold military analysis of the British historian Sir Basil, no, of the French Simon Shamer. Do you think of Simon Shamer as great history citizens, or do you think it was the best of times? It was the worst of times. And when you think of Sherman's march to the sea, do you think of the cold military analysis of Sir Basil Liddell Hart, British historian who wrote the objective of General Sherman in cutting a swath of destruction 60 miles wide, 300 to the sea, was to prove to the Confederacy that not only could the North destroy the superstructure of Confederate military resistance, they could also destroy the foundation of Confederate economic resistance, or do you think, as God is my witness, I'll never go hungry again. <laughs> I, I use that line in Atlanta. Um, about two months ago and got a big hand for that at that moment. They, they liked that one. They liked it so much they invited me back. Um, you read historical fiction for the people and the plots and the poetry. And when I sit down to write it, I replace poetry because the poetry will take care of itself. My goal is to write clear-cut, interesting prose, and if I do it well enough, it might become poetry. I don't know. I replace that one with place. So I sit down to write my historical fiction for the people, the plots, and the places. The plot of the Lincoln letter is, uh, is pretty simple. Abraham Lincoln, one night, is writing in his diary in the War Department telegraph office. Uh, did Lincoln keep a diary, you ask? Well, we don't think so. That's, that's why it says a novel on the front of the book. Uh, we do know that Lincoln kept all sorts of notes. He scrawled things to himself that he'd shove into his pockets, that he'd leave on the backs of envelopes, shove into the pigeonholes in the desks around him, and so forth and so on. Uh, his valet, William Slade, whom you probably, if you've seen the movie, you see him. Uh, he, He's with Lincoln in the boot shining scene with the sun, and he's the last guy to watch, watch Lincoln walk down the hallway on the way to the theater at the end of the movie. William Slade admitted that he used to burn all these little things. He'd grab them, take them out of Lincoln's pockets and so forth, and burn them all. And I thought to myself, 
what if we could get all that stuff together in a book? What an insight it would have been into Lincoln. And I thought, well, I know who I'll run this by. And we've been friends for years. I asked Doris Kearns Goodwin to have dinner with me one night. And I said, what would you think if there was a Lincoln diary out there? And she almost levitated from the chair. I said, a Lincoln diary. Imagine what that would be, what it would mean, not only for its financial value, but its scholarly value as well. Because you, we know that Lincoln wandered the, the halls of the White House lonely and lonely and depressed night after night with no one to talk to. So it would have just been a marvelous thing for him to have a diary to work in and something that he could leave behind to us. Because, of course, he was also very careful about what he said in public and even what he said in private to people. I said, Doris, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. Uh, so Lincoln's working in the diary. He leaves the diary on a desk in the War Department telegraph office on a night in 1862. The War Department telegraph office was like his second office. Every night, and sometimes a couple of times during the day, he would leave the White House, come across the lawn, into the War Department, which is on the site of what is today the old executive office building on Pennsylvania Avenue, directly across from the Renwick Gallery. Uh, he would leave his, uh, he would walk in by the side door, sit down, and wait for the telegrams to come, and chat and jaw with the young men around him. You, 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 you will get a real sense of Lincoln from the very opening scene in this novel uh, as he's talking with the young men in the telegraph office about nothing at all and everything at all. And he gets distracted and he leaves the diary. And a young officer who works there by the name of Halsey Hutchinson discovers it the next morning and says, the president left his diary. Oh, he can't want too many people to see this. I know what I'll do. I'll put it into my pocket and I'll give it to him as soon as I see him tonight. Bad decision. But in storytelling, bad decisions make the best stories. The novel is about the passage of that diary through the Civil War, who gets it, who wants it, who's prepared to kill for it, and what's in it. Uh, and then, of course, Peter Fallon. Some of you may have met Peter Fallon in Back Bay, or Harvard Yard, or the Lost Constitution. Uh, or City of Dreams, dealer in rare books and documents. He was in his late 20s when I was in my late 20s, uh, when we both came to know Back Bay. Peter was the main character in that book. The only dif the difference between him and me in that one, of course, was that he told his father he wanted to study history instead of going to law school. And his father said, history? Hmm, really rather see you go to law school. Uh, so I was proving to my father that I could find a lost treasure by writing about it and Peter was proving to his father that he could find it by going after it and using the knowledge that he had gained as a historian. And then in Harvard Yard, of course, he was in his late 40s and I was in my late 40s. We were both counseling our sons who were applying to Harvard. He said to his son what I said to my son. Some guys never get over the fact that they didn't get into Harvard, and some guys never get over the fact that they did. And I don't want you to be either kind. At the beginning of the Lost Constitution, um, which I thought would be the last Peter Fallon book, he was taking his son out to California to go to Bolt Hall, Berkeley, the law school out there. I was hearing this from my son. Dad, I want to go to film school. I said, film school, I'd really rather see you go to law school. But as your grandfather said to me, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Peter was still in his late 40s at that point, and I had moved past my late 40s. But Peter's going to stay in his late 40s because he has to fight hand to hand, and I gave that up a long time ago. Um, Peter gets wind of the Lincoln letter. It, the Lincoln letter that he reads, he gets wind of the fact that maybe that's, there's something down there that's even more valuable than the Lincoln letter that opens the book. And so he heads to Washington, D.C. And that is the place. Any of you who have read my novels know that 
place really matters to me. Location is very important. We are all the products of the places we build, the places we destroy, the places we choose to restore, and the places we choose to live. Uh, you've seen that, or I've seen that again and again in books like Back Bay or Annapolis or Cape Cod. All of them are very much about the, the, the importance and the significance of setting. And Peter gets to Washington, the beautiful, uh, white, sleek, modern city that you're all familiar with, at least in the tourist sections and the northwest sections. Um, and then we flip into the past, into the Washington of 1862, which was, ladies and gentlemen, a dump. And I'm going to bring that city to life for you. Uh, in 1850, when he visited, Dickens called Washington the city of great distances, with broad avenues that begin nowhere and end in nothing, running by hilltops covered with great half-finished limestone wedding cake buildings surrounded by rubble. Dickens didn't like Washington, D.C. too much. This city that had been built uh, on the hills and the marshes at the tip of the Potomac he, much, he didn't even like New York. He much preferred Boston, which showed some good taste, I think. Uh, as the Civil War began, Washington, D.C. had a population of about 35,000. Uh, in a year, it doubled. In another year, it doubled again. Uh, it became an overcrowded place with tremendous public health issues, uh, everything half finished, only two paved streets in the whole city, and a dirty, filthy, ugly, smelly canal that ran up from the east branch of the Potomac, cut around the base of Capitol Hill, made a right turn or a westerly turn there on the mall, and ran across the mall along the line of what is today Constitution Avenue out into the Potomac on the other side. The canal had been built to improve commerce in the 1820s and 1830s when they hadn't really anticipated the impact of railroads. and. Uh, now those canals had fallen into disuse so that they were basically wide open sewer trenches that people would dump garbage into, they would dump offal from the uh, meat markets, uh, and occasionally a dead body, as you will discover in the novel. Um, George Templeton Strong, famous New York diarist, showed up in Washington in 1862, and uh, he said this about it. Of all the detestable places, Washington, D.C. is the first. Bad food, bad quarters, bad smells, crowds, noise, filth, a plague of flies descending upon everything. Beelzebub surely reigns here, and the Willard Hotel is his headquarters. Uh, the Willard Hotel on the corner of 14th and Pennsylvania Avenue on the site of today's Willard Hotel was a four-story building that had been there for about 15 years at that point. Lincoln had stayed there when he first arrived before his inauguration. Everybody in Washington went to the Willard Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. The politicians would come down from Capitol Hill and go into the lobby and have a drink, have a chat. And everybody around, all the people who were over at the executive area, all of the people who were looking for something, they'd all gather there too. They'd hide behind newspapers and listen for conversations. They'd look for a politician coming in the room that they might grab by a lapel and say, I have something for you, Senator. I have something for you, Congressman. Uh, favors were exchanged in the lobby. Drinks were exchanged. The expression lobbyist began in the lobby of the Willard Hotel. Uh, and the kind of people who would come over there, in addition to the military contractors and the politicians, were the kind of people that Lincoln dealt with every morning in Washington, a city that in 1862 was filled with self-seekers, opportunists, political cut purses of every stripe and variety. The more you, the more you think about it, the more it sounds like today. Um, here's a description of what the front, front lawn of the White House looked like every morning in 1862. They were already lining up as they did each dawn. Office seekers, favor seekers, friends, relatives, 
relatives of relatives, men bearing letters of introduction, women bearing petitions of mercy, widows, orphans, inventors, scoundrels, scalawags, the sons of scalawags, and the sons of rich men too, all waiting for nine o'clock when the White House would officially open and they would crowd in under the portico, into the foyer, up the stairs, and if they were lucky, all the way to the reception room outside the President's office. Their petitions in one hand, their business cards in the other, their expectations high that before the day ended, the President himself would summon them to a personal audience and satisfy their petition or solve their problem. That is the longest sentence I have ever written. And I still can't read it on one tank of air. But I wrote it that way to give you that sense of, of push, of forward momentum, of people trying to get into that place and up those stairs. It was said that at the beginning, Lincoln had spent most of his day with these people. His secretaries had imposed some order on the process so that he could put in a proper day's work, but he still insisted on seeing them. He called it his public opinion bath. Uh, these people all came to Washington looking for a handout looking for a piece of the action, and they were there in the White House every day. They would, they would line up. When the door opened, they'd go in up the stairs. Mrs. Lincoln was appalled by them because, of course, they were going right by her bedroom, but because the president's office wasn't in the west. The, there was no Oval Office at this point. The president's office was on the east end looking out uh, onto, the, uh, onto the Potomac. And these people would stop and they'd look into a room that, oh, Mrs. Lincoln's put in beautiful draperies there in, that, uh, in, in, the, in the blue room. Give, give me your jackknife, quick. And they'd go in, they'd cut little pieces out of the fabric and out of the rugs. This was going on throughout the time that the Lincolns were in the White House. The president, of course, disagreed with his wife about the need for decorating the uh, public rooms of the White House not so much be because they were being uh, occasionally souvenir hunted like this, but because, as he said to her, you are spending money on fripperies while young men are dying. And sometimes he'd dig into his own pocket rather than dip into the public uh, treasury to fix these rooms up. But that's what Washington was like, filled with people like that. And uh, let me just read you one more description of what Washington looked like physically. Uh, Halsey Hutchinson is the main character in the book, and he's walking, uh, walking home one morning. He walks down 15th Street and turns onto Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, as the executive branch, re as, as the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue resumed its diagonal run toward Capitol Hill, and as the panoply opened before him, his thought was always the same. If this was the grandest thoroughfare in Washington, it did not bode well for the rest of the Republic. Its width befit a street of high ambition in the capital of an ambitious nation, and it was lined with trees and buildings, and it was angled so as to draw the eye toward that fine distant prospect, the hill atop which sat the national legislature. But width merely afforded more room for mud to spurt up through cracked cobblestones, for pigs and fowl to run wild, for wagons and omnibuses to break down. It also separated the respectable activities of the north side, hotels, theaters, and businesses from the area called Murder Bay, a triangle of land formed by Pennsylvania on the north, the canal on the south, and 15th Street on the west, and into which were crammed enough saloons, dance halls, gambling hells, and bordellos to satisfy every corps in the Army of the Potomac should they all go on leave at once. By the way, Murder Bay, that triangle of land, uh, is now occupied by the IRS uh, and the FBI and is known as the Federal Triangle. Uh, the best that could be said of the trees was that when they leafed out, they performed the aesthetic miracle of blocking most of the ramshackle buildings from view. As for the pillared capital, it appeared as if someone had stuck a giant egg beater in its roof to mix up whatever was inside. Construction of a dome had begun in 1859, but the war had stopped it. Now the crane holding up the cast iron ribs resembled the beater handle and the ribs looked like the paddles. But the work would resume, the president had insisted. He said that finishing the dome would symbolize the continuity of the nation. In a city of bleak reality, thought Halsey, hopeful symbols had their place. Keep that image in your mind, the unfinished Capitol Dome. 
uh, as we talk here about, about Lincoln and his movement from lawyer to leader, from a careful politician to the moral avatar of the age. Because that's what, that's what you see in the evolution of Lincoln's presidency. Which brings me to the people. This book is filled with people who fascinate me. The modern characters, of course, Peter Fallon, lobbyists, businessmen, all the other people who are trying to track down this lost Lincoln log. And the historical characters fascinate me as well. Uh, I have always loved in writing historical fiction, and this is the other reason I love to do it, the opportunity to look history in the eye. When I was a kid, my father gave me a book called No Survivors. It was a Western uh, uh, by a guy named Will Henry. It was a big book in the uh, 60s, about late 50s, early 60s, about Custer's Last Stand. And there's a moment in the book when uh, the main character, who is a scout, is riding along with Custer, and they come to the top of the ridge, and they look down into Medicine Tail Cooley, and the scout looks at Custer and says, I wouldn't go down there if I were you, General. I got a really bad feeling about this. And uh, when I read that and later thought about it, I said to myself, what I was experiencing in reading that book was history before it became history. Uh, and that's what I try to do for you when you read one of these novels. You'll experience history before it's history, when things can go one way or the other, uh, in one direction or another, and things might have changed if somebody, somewhere along the line, had made a better decision about a particular moment in time. In the very first chapter, you'll meet Lincoln, and then down the street, my character goes in that walk that I've just read to you, and he gets to the National Hotel, which is where all the young officers from the, uh, the War Department stayed. And he sits down at the shoeshine stand, and there comes John Wilkes Booth, sits down right next to him. So he meets both of them in the first chapter. You'll meet Oliver Wendell Holmes and McClellan and uh, a lot of those political backstabbers that I was telling you about, historical characters that we won't go into too much now. You'll also meet Walt Whitman. Uh, I, also, I always wanted to write about Whitman and, or one of those New England writers, maybe Louisa May Alcott. She didn't quite make it into the book, just more for timing than for anything else. But I, I got Whitman into the book nursing the young men in the Armory Square Hospital and places like that. But the one you're interested in is Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, March 1861, is a 51-year-old man with a dark beard that he's just grown, looks good, stands straight, uh, has come back into politics because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He has decided, along with a lot of Americans, that while slavery can, can remain in the, in the slave states as they exist now, slavery cannot extend into the territories. It must be stopped somewhere, and he's made his decision. And now he's president. But the Abraham Lincoln who stands in front of that unfinished Capitol Dome that day is, is not the marble figure that you see today at the far end of the mall in the uh, Lincoln Memorial. He was a man of contradictions. He always presented himself as a, um, a kind of backwoods lawyer, uh, just a jack-legged lawyer, as he called himself. But he was the shrewdest politician in the room. He was a constitutional scholar, and people knew the knowledge that he had about the Constitution. And yet Lincoln would suspend constitutional rights more than once in order to defend his vision of a constitutional union. He hated the sight of blood and yet would prosecute the bloodiest war in American history in order to preserve that constitutional vision. And he loved to tell a joke. He loved to tell a funny story. He always said, if I couldn't laugh, I would go crazy and yet he wore his sadness around his shoulders like a shawl because some historians believe that he suffered from deep, serious bouts of clinical depression. And perhaps most interestingly, for a 21st century audience, Abraham Lincoln was a typical 19th century white man in his racial attitudes. 
even though he had always hated slavery, he had always hated it uh, on an intellectual basis. He had always said, uh, how can a nation that believes in the Declaration of Independence, um, how can such a nation enslave four million of its citizens? It's hypocrisy. And if this nation does not change at some point, uh, I should prefer to leave such a hypocritical place and live, say, in Russia, where they make no pretense to respecting the freedoms of their population. Nevertheless, he did not believe in the intellectual equivalency of blacks to whites. He did not believe that blacks and whites should intermarry. As he said in his 1858 debates with Stephen Douglas, he was in full support of, of, of Illinois' law, laws against racial intermarriage. And as late as 1862, Abraham Lincoln called into his office uh, on an August afternoon, a delegation of five freed slaves sat them down in his office and said to them that slavery is the worst evil that has ever been perpetrated by one race upon another. But across this broad land, not a single member of your race is ever put on a level of equivalency with a single member of our race. Would it not be better if we separated? He then proposed what he had proposed many times before and what very liberal thinkers uh, among the emancipationist classes had been thinking for 40 years or so, that once emancipation became a reality, they would then face the reality of the fact that the races could never live together and that it would be incumbent upon the federal government to provide funds to support migrations of freed blacks back to Central America or back to Africa. This is August of 1862. He's already written the Emancipation Proclamation at this point. He hasn't revealed it to the world yet, but he's thought seriously about it. Well, Frederick Douglass was furious about this, and William Lloyd Garrison, the great Massachusetts abolitionist, fulminated in the Liberator that these people had been born here in the course of nature and deserved to die here in the same way. Uh, there was great anger about all of this. This, of course, was the same month in which Horace Greeley, famous newspaper editor of the North, had begged Lincoln to emancipate the slaves. And Lincoln had written to Horace Greeley and said, my objective in this war is to save the Union. If I can free all of the slaves and save it, I will do that. If I can free only some of the slaves and save the Union, I will do that. If I can free none of the slaves and save the Union, that will be my course. And he believed that publicly, but all during that year of 1862, he was moving toward what was, uh, and it doesn't seem that way to us today, it doesn't seem that momentous to us today, and the movie even focuses on the 13th Amendment, the momentousness of the 13th Amendment rather than the Emancipation Proclamation. In that respect, I think they they got it wrong. Lincoln was moving uh, throughout 1862 toward an Emancipation Proclamation. But why? Uh, we know he opposed slavery. However, he had hoped that they could get rid of slavery without a war. He had hoped for a, an emancipation that would be compensated, voluntary, and gradual. He'd even written in his notes, $400 a head for, for each slave times four million, that's how many slaves there were, equals how many days of war? Uh, it probably would have been cheaper to have freed the slaves and paid for them. And he tried to do this. In the spring of 1862, uh, things were looking very bad for the North. Uh, he was trying to find a new way to convince the American people that they had to prosecute this war because he had all kinds of people saying, no, don't do it, peace Democrats. Uh, war Democrats, emancipationists, the abolitionists wanted them to free everybody right away. Um, and it took him until July of 1862 to come to the conclusion, as he said to Secretary of State Seward and Secretary of Navy Gideon Wells, I have come to the decision that I must free the slaves on a, uh, uh, it is a military necessity. A military necessity 
not a moral necessity. This was where he got to in the summer of 1862. Uh, he knew that he could not antagonize the loyal border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland, all slave states. He didn't want to antagonize them because if they seceded, the whole house of cards that he had built in the North would fall apart. So he thought about how he could emancipate slaves to impact the South and at the same time placate those people in the North that wanted emancipation quickly. And that was how he came to the Emancipation Proclamation, which was revealed on July 22nd, 1862. Uh, only to the cabinet, however. The cabinet members were pleased by Lincoln's decision. They were pleased by the fact that Lincoln was thinking about freeing those slaves because if he freed them, the South would lose all of its logistical support. The people who dug the ditches and grew the, grew the uh, crops and tended the, the livestock. And those people would start to come over to the Union side and then the Union generals would have to make a decision as to what to do with them. The idea of the Emancipation Proclamation was to make all of that clear to them. The other idea of the Emancipation Proclamation was that he didn't have to ask anybody about this. This was to be an executive order in which he was using his war powers as president to achieve a military objective and deny the enemy the use of those slaves. They told him in the cabinet just to wait until they had a victory because the North was being pummeled, battle after battle. So they waited until after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, Lincoln sat the cabinet down again a few days later and said to them, I'm not asking for your advice this time, I've made my decision. Uh, a few days later, the Emancipation Proclamation was revealed to the world, and there were great repercussions. Of course, the South was furious, but in the North there was great joy, not only in the North, but in Europe where things had now been clarified for the British and the French who had been thinking about recognizing the Confederacy because they needed some cotton and the blockade was beginning to hurt them. Now they would never come in on the side of the South because they would clearly at this point be siding with a slave state rather than a free state, a state fighting for the freedom of these slaves. Lincoln had understood all along that as he said to Chen Senator Charles Sumner on July 4th, 1862, who was begging him to free the slaves, Senator, uh, if I free the slaves, half the officers' corps will desert and I will have nothing but trouble ahead. Half the officers' corps didn't desert, but they grumbled, they weren't happy, and in the North, in the October elections, Lincoln lost 31 seats in the House of Representatives to the, to the Democrats. Uh, shortly thereafter, he fired General McClellan. Shortly thereafter, he told a friend that all the praise in the world, all the praise he had received from the newspapers about this Emancipation Proclamation were the kinds of thing that any vain man could want. But, as he pointed out, Remember, he might have been an idealist, but he was a very practical man. As he pointed out, the Emancipation Proclamation has not inspired further enlistments, and the stock market is still down. He was thinking about how to fight this war on many fronts. January 1st arrived. He had given the South literally 100 days from September 22nd to January 1st to come back into the fold. The rebellious states were told, if you come back into the fold, you can keep your slaves for now. We'll deal with that later. But if you don't come back into the fold, those slaves will, and here's the ringing phrase, then thenceforward and forever be free. January 1st, none of the southern states came back. All morning, he shakes hands in the East Room with the people who come past the president in the same way that they used to come up to the Hall of Flags and greet the governor on January 1st. At noon, Lincoln went up to his office and sat down and looked at the hand-engrossed copy of the Emancipation Proclamation and picked up the pen, a pen that you can now find in the Massachusetts Historical Society, by the way. If you go over there, you can see it. Uh, he picked up the pen and realized that his hand was shaking. 
and he put the pen down and said to the people around him, if I ever go into the history books, it will be for this act. My whole heart and soul is in it. Now, this is a long way that he's traveled from just being a careful and shrewd politician exercising an executive order here to deny the enemy his military uh, su support at home. Now my whole heart and soul is in it. And if they, a hundred years from now, see that my signature wavered, they will, they will say he hesitated. Then he waited, then he reached over and picked up the pen and signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, that third Emancipation Proclamation, the final version, contained, um, well, it didn't contain one of the things that had been in the first two versions, uh, financial provisions to colonize the slaves. That had been dropped out. This proclamation also contained a provision allowing blacks to enlist in the Union Army. Lincoln, as a president, as a man, like most of us, like most presidents, traveled a long learning curve. There was an arc to his life, and an arc to his presidency, and an arc to his attitude toward uh, slavery and toward blacks. And somewhere along that line, as he approached that final Emancipation Proclamation, he had come to the conclusion that, no, I don't think we need to colonize these people, and, you know, we sure could use their help in this war. I sort of leave Lincoln there at that point uh, in the novel and go on with my fictional characters because they're the ones that, that carry my drama. Good fictional characters like the young man named Halsey Hutchinson in this book are foils for history and stand-ins for us because who in this room wouldn't have loved an opportunity at some point to have met Lincoln, even if we had to be one of those people standing in line to get up the stairs to see him uh, in the morning. But it's, and I don't pick Lincoln up again until March of 1865. But it's important to talk a little bit about what happened in 1864. The presidential election of 1864 is approaching. It's the summer. Abraham Lincoln has himself a new general, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And Ulysses S. Grant has already met hideous slaughter at Spotsylvania. Uh, his army has thought, well, after a defeat, Union generals usually turn and run. That night, Grant gave orders to keep moving south. Then he sent a letter to the pres uh, president in which he said, I mean to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Words that Lincoln had hoped to hear. But the next day, uh, well, no, the next day was Spotsylvania. The, the first battle was the wilderness. The next day was Spotsylvania. And a few days later, the hideous bloodletting at Cold Harbor. Uh, the people of the North were shocked at how willingly Ulysses S. Grant was spending the, the capital of the North. And the North's capital was the young men. They outnumbered the South uh, by almost 10 to 1 by the end of the war, in terms of the size of those armies. And, and, Grant, and Grant would spend that capital. And um, the people of the North saw this hideous bloodletting. They, they understood what Lee was now doing, which was fighting that war of retreat. Uh, if he could just hold on long enough that the Northern people would tire of the war, they might turn Lincoln out of office. And it looked like that was going to happen in the summer of 1862. And a, rep, a delegation from Congress, pro-Lincoln men, came to the White House and said, Mr. President, you may lose this next election unless you go back on emancipation. But by now, these 100,000 black troops had already proven their worth at Battery Wagner and other places. And Lincoln had come to know and like Frederick Douglass, whom he would later call one of the few men in America whose opinion really mattered to him. And he said to this delegation, my objective in winning this war has been to preserve the Union. But no power on heaven or earth could put down this rebellion without using the emancipation lever 
Interesting choice of words. It's the kind of thing that a politician would say. I'm pressing this lever to make things work, and if that doesn't work, I'll press that lever, without using the emancipation lever, as I have done. But if I send those men back to slavery, those 100,000 who have joined, I will be damned in time and eternity. He then insisted that the 13th Amendment be put into the plank of the Republican Party. When he had stood in front of the unfinished Capitol Dome in March of 1861, uh, he had ringing in his ears a debate that had been going on in Congress uh, a week earlier in which Congress had suggested that maybe they would do a 13th Amendment which guaranteed the rights, the property rights, of Southern slaveholders. Lincoln had said, I'm not going to interfere with the rights of those men in the South. Uh, I, am, I do not believe we need an amendment for this. I am for the old chart and the old pilots, by which he meant the, the original Constitution. Uh, by the way, when he stood in front of that audience, it was all white men who were in the audience. You can see that in the pictures. You can read it in the news reports. Well, things were changing rapidly by 1864, and he now supported the 13th Amendment that would eradicate slavery. And you've all seen the movie, probably. The 13th Amendment is passed in February. Uh, in March, Lincoln re-elected, fortunately, thanks to, among other people, General Sherman taking Atlanta on September 1st, writing to Lincoln, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Public opinion in the North changed right after that. Lincoln could stand in front of the audience on the, at the second inauguration. He is now an old, broken man not that 51-year-old man that you had seen a few years earlier. Now he's 55, and he looks 85. But behind him is a completed Capitol Dome, monumental and beautiful to our eyes today in our era of monumental architecture. Imagine what it meant to those people who could see it then, that symbol of a completed nation. And now Lincoln knows that the war is coming to an end, and he can talk about it almost in the past tense. Both sides abhorred war, but one side would make war rather than see the Union survive. The other would accept war rather than let it perish. So the war came. He then moves to the reasons for the war, and he doesn't talk about tariffs, and he doesn't talk about states' rights, things that we had been arguing over in this country from the Constitution to the Civil War things that we would continue to argue about from the Civil War to the present, he talks about slavery. Slavery was the cause of the Civil War. And we had to expiate this sin in blood because it wasn't, as he points out, an Amer a Confederate sin. It was American slavery. That's the term that he uses. Uh, he probably doesn't know at this point, but it is a fact that the first documentary evidence of a slave in America is not in the South. It appears in the ledger books of the Newtown, opened in 1638, uh, later to become Harvard College. The man's name was Jacob. He swept the floors of the, uh, the building that you now see memorialized in the middle of Mass Ave, in front of Holyoke Center. The gentlemen of New England, the families of New England, had made a healthy fortune on that supply of cheap cotton that ran their textile mills. So it was American slavery. We were all paying that sin. 650,000 of us on the battlefields. Probably another 100,000, no one will ever know, amongst the civilian population, mostly in the South. Fondly do we hope and fervently do we pray that this scourge of war may speedily pass away. But if the Lord wills it, if 250 years of the bondsman's lawyer shall be, labor shall be sunk, if every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be answered by another drawn with the sword, so it was said 250 years ago, it must be said today. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Then he moved on to the last paragraph, with malice toward none, with charity for all. That night he saw Frederick Douglass at a reception in the East Room of the White House and asked him, what did you think of the speech? Frederick Douglass said, it was not a political tract, sir. It was a sermon. It was a sacred effort. 
And so most Americans believed. But when you look at pictures of Lincoln, old and bent over, standing there on that podium, in front of that audience, in front of that completed Capitol Dome, an audience, by the way, that by news reports of the day included probably 50% freed slaves, black African slaves, American freedmen. Standing on the pediment above Lincoln is John Wilkes Booth, thinking his dastardly thoughts. A month later, Lincoln will give another speech that Booth will attend. Lincoln will give this speech from the second floor windows of the White House. It's the speech about Reconstruction. And in this speech to an audience on the Tuesday night April 11th, in fact, anniversary tonight, Tuesday night, April 11th, 1865, a speech about Reconstruction. Lincoln will say that those 100,000 men who have served so bravely may deserve the vote. Booth, in the crowd that night, it was a misty night, torchlight sizzling, crowd expecting a big barn burner of a speech, and Lincoln was giving them a careful, thoughtful analysis of what lay ahead instead. In the crowd that night was Booth. He leaned over to Lewis Powell, his co-conspirator, and said, that means Negro, and he used a different word, that means Negro citizenship. That is the last speech he will ever give. I will put him through. And so he did. You know the rest of that story, but Perhaps you don't know this part of it. This is something that I open the novel with and that I close with for you tonight. Uh, the next morning, a young officer went to the White House. He wrote about this in a letter a few, months, a few weeks later. He went to the White House as a member of the US Army Surgical Corps in order to perform the autopsy, a primitive forensic analysis of the president's body. He described going up the stairs, stepping into a bedroom, into the midst of the stunned, shocked military representatives and political representatives of the Lincoln administration. And there in the middle of the room, on two boards, suspended on two sawhorses, covered in sheets and towels, was the cold, dead body, naked body, the President of the United States. He described the autopsy. He described the removal and dissection of Lincoln's brain, the search for the bullet, which he could not find until, as he wrote, suddenly it, it slipped through my fingers and fell into the basin beneath. Its sound shocking the silence in that room. There it lay dull, motionless, harmless, no bigger than the tip of my finger. Yet the cause of such mighty changes in the world's history as perhaps we may never know. Whenever you think that human beings are driven by history and events rather than the other way around, think about that letter. Think of how different America might have looked had Lincoln lived especially the America of the second half of the 19th century. And then think of how different America might have looked had Lincoln never lived. Well, I'll just leave you with one story about uh, the writing of this book. When I got to uh, about May of the, the, May of whatever year it was, year before last, I realized I was way behind. I'm always way behind in the writing of these books. I'm always much further behind than I want to be. But I realized that if I was going to finish the book in order to publish it this past September, which was the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, I had to basically put my head down and spend nine months doing nothing but writing. And so I did. And the worst part about it was that I found myself writing late into the night, which I generally don't like to do, 
So it would be 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I'd be saying, oh, I can barely stay awake. This is terrible. I used to be able to do this, but not anymore. And uh, then it came to the night when I wrote my way to the front door of Ford's Theater. And I looked at my watch. I said, it's midnight. Oh, my God, I'm so tired. But I finally made it to Ford's Theater. I'm almost done. Now I can go to bed. And just then, the front door of the Star Saloon banged open. And John Wilkes Booth loped up the street and stopped and looked me in the eyes and said, you don't want to go to bed yet, Bill. Come on inside, see what's going to happen next. So I followed Booth into the theater, and we stopped in the lobby. We listened to see what the laugh line of the play was at that moment. And I followed Booth up the stairs and stayed up all night to write the scene. And I think when you get to that scene, all of you will stay up all night, too. Um, I've had a great time writing it. They're all, every book is, is satisfying in some new way. I've been able to travel around researching all sorts of interesting locations. Interestingly enough, I had a daughter living in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so there was yet another one of those interesting little synergies there. Go and visit one of the kids and write about the place as well. My wife and I wandered all of the battlefields. She, uh, she learned to cook some of the meals that I had hoped that, uh, that I had some of the characters eating, meals that I just wanted to taste, like she crab soup, which was served in the, um, uh, which is basically just a creamy crab Newberg type thing, which was served in the Gosling restaurant on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I learned that stuff from reading the newspapers. I read the Civil War era newspapers, the Washington Daily Republican, which is put online by the um, uh, Library of Congress, and I would not only read the battle news, I would read the ads as well, uh, the theater ads, for example. You want to chill. Read the Washington Daily Republican for uh, April 10th, Monday, April 10th. The war is over. Every, everybody, or the war is about to be over. Everybody's happy. And um, Mr. Ford of Ford's Theater takes an ad in the paper, appearing this week. Miss Laura Keene in Our American Cousin. Show closes on Friday night. Well, it sure did close on Friday night. But news, things like that, and then letters to the editor, all of the, all of the stuff that provides me with the texture that I think brings this world to life for you. I want you to live in 1862 Washington. I want you to see how these people thought and acted and reacted and how they scraped the mud off their boots. Because if I can do all of that, and in many ways they were different from us, I can drive home to you how familiar they were to us, uh, how similar they were to us. And so when my main character follows Booth into that theater, and he doesn't quite know what Booth's up to, and he's there for another purpose, uh, you will identify with that fictional character even more and yet at the same time, they'll be running in the back of your head the hope that maybe somehow this fictional character is going to figure out a way to change history. Will he? You'll have to read the book to find out. Thank you all for coming.